their life stories, children and teenagers involved in the child welfare system describe, described the experiences of moral injury. Some of the events they described as morally injurious included child maltreatment, the failure of caregivers to protect them, and assault to their core identities, for example, as Roma or indigenous people. These injuries occurred in birth homes and were perpetrated by parents, but also in foster homes and social service agencies perpetrated by foster parents and child welfare professionals. Moral injuries also were experienced um, by events perpetrated by the self, for example, abuse of younger children. The young people also described a variety of different targets of the morally injurious behavior. They experienced moral injury not only from behaviors directed at them, but also from witnessing problematic behavior directed at other children, for example, the abuse of a sibling, and also other adults, such as violence in the home. Our young participants described that these moral injuries are burdens that they carry with them into adulthood. We also reflected on how investigators, caseworkers, and supervisors might minimize the risk of moral injury at the individual client level, that is through their own interactions with children and youth, as well as implication for systems level change. Next slide, please. So today, we're going to focus on our young participants' descriptions of how they soothe moral injury, including how they want to be supported. Next slide, please. Our specific questions are, what are emerging adults' resources for soothing moral injury experienced in childhood and adolescence? What advice do participants offer to other youth who experience moral injury in the child welfare system? And what advice do participants offer to professionals in the child welfare system? Next slide, please. And to recap really quickly from our first sessions, we recruited 28 ethnically diverse emerging adults with foster care histories from four Midwestern states to share their experiences with us. And, if, and um, to clarify, emerging adulthood is a period of life in which one is transitioning into an adult role. And in the US that generally encompasses the range of about 18 years to about 25 or 26 years. Next uh, slide, please. So we collected in-depth information on each of these young people's lives to understand the experience of moral injury. To review, we administered the moral injury events scale, a nine item self-report life of scale that identifies moral transgressions of others moral transgressions of the self, and also has a betrayal subscale. We also conducted individual, in-depth, audio-recorded interviews where participants elaborated on their niece responses in the context of a life story that included their involvement in the child welfare system. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Next slide. Not all of the participants in our study were doing well at the time of the interview. As might be expected, some were um, struggling with substance misuse uh, or mental health issues or housing insecurity. In general, however, most seemed very resilient and satisfied with their trajectories. When we asked these young people about what helps them to soothe moral injury, Many express what we've characterized as a positive life philosophy. This life philosophy included some combination of spiritual beliefs, hope, gratitude, forgiveness, agency, pro-social activities, and the ability to find meaning in their experiences, even those difficult experiences. Rita, a 20-year-old Latina, described self-forgiveness and the development of agency as critical for soothing her moral injury and moving forward in a positive direction. Um, she said, quote, I felt very guilty for not doing enough for my brother. And just as an aside, her brother um, was being abused in foster care. 
she went on. But then I also understand, and I kind of forgive myself and understand that I couldn't have done much. At some points, I made it really clear. And at some points, I was really strong and I voiced my opinion very strongly, end of quote. She also describes how she was able to find meaning in um, the orientation that she developed as a result of these experiences and that allowed her to push herself forward and graduate from college. It, and she's referring to those uh, struggles that she experienced as a child and adolescence with moral injury. It gave me a lot of ambition and a lot of will to fight, end of quote. Um, next slide, please. We also asked the young people how they had come to their life philosophies. How did these life philosophies develop? They described the importance of having supportive relationships with adults, foster or adoptive parents, counselors, birth parents. So those of you who were with us um, yesterday heard about um, uh, the effects of moral injury um, by adults perpetrated towards them. And here we have another perspective that is how helpful, how important, how healing the relationships were with effective and nurturing foster and adoptive parents, um, nurturing case counselors and birth parents. So Maya, a 23 year old Latina, described how having a caseworker that she could trust and that stood by her side was a significant support in overcoming a moral injury sustained by a school counselor's betrayal and regained trust in people. She said, quote, I had a case manager that advocated when I was in trouble at school. Another student at the school had just went into foster care. And so the school counselor disclosed to them that I was in foster care. And it was really a violation for someone to walk up with that personal information about me. I was really upset. And I reached out to my caseworker and she addressed it immediately. And there were times where her hands know that she tried more than anyone else. When I was 18 and I lost my birth mother, she was leaving for her maternity. I had already been assigned a new caseworker, but she set aside the time to come to the hospital after I lost my mom. She did her best to be there. She's no longer with the state, but I give her updates like three times a year, end of quote. Participants also recognized interventions by mental health providers and social service professionals as supporting their recovery, as well as supportive relationships with contemporaries, such as friends, siblings, and intimate partners. They also mentioned policies and program off programs that offered them support as they transitioned into adulthood. Next slide, please. When asked for advice they would offer to children and youth in the foster, in the foster care, uh, in foster care experiencing moral injury, participants stressed perspective taking, spirituality, and seeking out positive relationships with supportive adults. John, a 19 year old indigenous man, for example, encouraged other foster kids to put their experience in a life perspective and maintain hope and energy moving forward. He emphasized not hanging on to bad experiences. He said, quote, I definitely tell the kid that the most important thing is that you're in foster care now, but you're not going to be here forever. So don't look at, look at it as a punishment. Look at it as you're getting ready to live on your own. Because you're not going to be able to go back to your mom, your dad, your grandma, your auntie, you know, no one is going to take care of you for your whole life. This is for you to learn how to be independent and get on your own, end of quote. Jada, a 23-year-old African-American woman, discussed spirituality and faith and positive relationships with supportive adults. She said, quote, for me, God first, because he knows where you're going to go. He sees the end before you do. 
He knows your plan. He knows the plans that he has for you. Also, there's always going to be someone there. Uh, there's always going to be that case manager. There's always going to be that teacher or counselor or someone that's going to be there for you. I tell them, don't be afraid to reach out for help. Tell someone what's going on, if something's going on. Next slide, please. Participants also provided advice to professionals and other adults. Many stressed changes that they viewed were needed in the system. They emphasized what we are just calling here a child-centered approach. They said things like, they, they emphasized things like, um, quote, treating children as humans. They talk about valuing their opinions and voices. Um, a, a one young person said they need to let children have a seat at the table. Participants advised child welfare professionals to listen to children. They advised foster parents to focus on building trusting relationships with children. Amira, a 20 year old white woman who participates in foster parent trainings, advised child welfare professionals to quote, look into these foster parents because I hear so many stories of children coming from abusive homes into foster parents who also abuse them. And so workers need to start looking at children more as humans than case numbers. And most of the time, the case workers don't listen to the child. So the child will say something and then the foster parent, of course, they could quickly change that. The worker will believe the parent over the child. In the quote. Amira advised foster parents, quote, I tell them always make sure the child is comfortable. Get to know them. Maybe tell them a little bit about you. Um, of course, we're going to have problems trusting people and they're like, quote, well, we can't get them to, I, we can't get them to trust us. Well, get to know them a little bit. Maybe take them out to food or go play basketball with them or do something with that child to help build that rapport with them because we're all human. Um, next slide, please. Tasha's life story illustrates a number of of the major themes expressed by our participants. At the time of her participation in our study, she was 24 and completing college. Tasha and her mother lived with her maternal grandmother until Tanya was five. Her mother struggled with addiction. As a young child, Tanya was in care for two years and then returned to live with her mother and grandmother. When Tasha was 12, her grandmother died and her mother placed her back in the system voluntarily. Tasha aged out of the system uh, at the age of 18. Tasha reported multiple morally injurious events during adolescence perpetrated by social service providers and foster parents. To soothe these injuries, Tasha M described letting go of them through supportive relationships, meaning making, and the development of agency. Next slide, please. Tasha described the life philosophy that she had developed. Quote, I feel like I'm at the age when I got to be 17, I felt like I just understood. I can't blame my parents for everything because at the end of the day, I'm okay, you know? Because this was something temporary that happened to me. I didn't have a bad life growing up, you know? It's just this foster care thing. It was a speed bump. And so at the end of the day, I'm a good child. I didn't do nothing wrong. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I go to school. I go to work. I go home. End of quote. She also described how she developed this life philosophy. Quote, I think that it was the people that I put in my life. Not only that, it was what I have to do to my, for myself and realizing that, you know, this is my life. I have to do things for myself because no one else is going to do it for me. And so it was that, and I also had other people that were in my life. Next slide, please. 
Tasha centers her advice to child welfare professionals on the way foster families are trained and overseen, while emphasizing seeing the child in this process and paying more attention to what the kids are going through. She said, quote, I feel like we probably need to do more than just background searches. We just have to just where are this person, to just see where this person is at mentally. I don't want the child to feel like they're just a dollar bill. I want them to feel like a regular person. I feel like a lot of these foster parents feel like they can just throw kids away and get another one. Next slide, please. Now we're at the very beginning of our examination of moral injury in children and youth involved in the child welfare system. Um, there's still much that we need to learn. For example, how prevalent is moral injury? What are the developmental outcomes? Also, um, this work is retrospective. In a way, that's good because it's young people who have just come out of the child welfare system and they can kind of look back and reflect on uh, the experience growing up. But I think it's really important that we consult children and adolescents directly to continue building our understanding of their experiences. Next slide, please. So before we move on to consider implications, we would really like to hear your thoughts. Does the advice offered by these young people resonate with your own experiences as professionals? Um, now you can either, again, you can type in the chat or you can use the hand raise function and we'll turn on your mic. But just remember the session is being recorded. So I'm gonna go to the chat now and we'll give people a minute to, to respond. All right, we're getting some comments here. Um, the participants' advice is really universal. Treat all the parents and children like humans. Listen to them. Their advice about developing a positive life philosophy applies to all of us. Exactly. And then we have a question. Is there any difference found between natural supports and professional supports? That is a really interesting question. I know that there is some research that looks at um, natural mentors versus mentors that are assigned by organizations. And um, I think one of the takeaways from that literature for me is that it's really important to teach kids how to identify, approach, and seek out and initiate relationships with people in their environment who are supportive and could serve as natural mentors. And when you can do that, when kids can do that, or when they can be supportive to do that, those relationships tend to be more sustained. Um, and that's of course important in terms of just providing guidance over time and trust building. All right, um, the comments the young adults made is aligned with the research on how resiliency can be developed in young people. Absolutely. The challenge is creating a child welfare system that helps kids develop resiliency. This underscores the importance of the system integrating child well-being into how it responds. Exactly. And last, uh, in our second webinar, that was one of the, the um, emphases of, of some of our participants um, to trying to create a more child-centered um, system and that really prioritizes emotional well-being and safety alongside of physical safety. Wendy, I was wondering if I could interject. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, so for the question about the difference between natural supports and professional supports, um, I remember uh, with the participants from this study, uh, there was a difference in the way the supports were talked about. 
Um, so the ways, the reasons why a professional support would be in your life and be supportive of you and be present for you compared to why a natural support would be. Um, the same was true with, uh, with the injuries themselves, like the forms of moral injury perpetrated by professional supports were different than natural, like would be supports. Um, so just like in the, in the language that participants use, there is like a sense of uh, like, well, this is your job with a professional compared to inherently you should be here for me or because of qualities of me, you are around with the natural support. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Johara. Now, um, we'll have an opportunity um, to hear from you again um, in, in just a minute here. Um, oops, wait a minute, let's see. Let me just go up here. Assisting foster parents' mental health and motivation resonates. As I do my best to find placements for young people in foster care. Sometimes young people pick up on things from their previous experience that I do not. Foster parents are often different when a case manager is in the room. Are there any less obvious uh, cues that workers can look, oh, shoot, cut off from me. Yeah. That, you had it. Are there any less obvious cues that caseworkers could look for? Ah, okay. What do you think, uh, Johara? Have you got any? Well, I'm just thinking in back to the life story examples. The idea of just asking a young person what their experience has been out of the presence of the foster parents. So, like having those consistent check-ins to see from the youth's perspective how they're doing, how they're feeling about this placement, and taking what they're saying seriously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll we'll stop the chat for just a minute, and then we'll want to hear from you again. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Johara to reflect on some of the implications of young people's advice. And then we'll ask you um, to respond again. So next slide. Thank you, Wendy. Facilitating the development of a positive life philosophy may be a long-term ongoing process in which social service professionals can be there to recognize and validate youth's experiences, feelings, and desires. This would begin by strengthening and initiating meaningful relationships in youth lives. Consistency of therapy, case management, uh, or case managers, and others in foster youth's life can't be more emphasized. Mentoring programs in which foster youth graduates share their experiences, advice, and guidance with current foster youth may have a double benefit for both mentors and mentees. Toward the goal of increasing mentor connections for youth in foster care, and also just to provide an example of how much more attention is being put towards the idea of mentoring, the benefits of mentoring, the Foster Youth Mentoring Act, which was passed in 2019, offers funding, federal funding for both peer-to-peer -peer mentoring programs and non-peer volunteer-based mentoring programs. It also includes encouragement for programming that is informed by the experiences and perspectives of young people who have, who have themselves been in foster care. Uh, mentoring programs like Y Mentors through the YMCA, and I think the YMCA also has some other forms of one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, adult mentoring support for youths. Uh, Foster Club, which is a national network of youth who with experience themselves in foster care, Mentor Minnesota, or just looking through the National Mentoring Registry, uh, the Mentoring Connector are all good examples of places to look to connect youth in foster care to mentors. Uh, more research, though, is needed to be done. Uh, is needed to develop specific interventions that support the development of a positive life philosophy to soothe moral injury, specifically. Next slide, please. And I, I talked about this uh, on Tuesday. Um, so for those of you who are there, this will feel repetitive, um, but it bears repeating. 
as trauma-informed or trauma-focused therapies become increasingly available, for example, brain spotting, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, we want to think about which available trauma therapies include components that also address responses to moral injury um, and support that healing, that healing and that development of a positive life philosophy. Internal family systems, also known as parts work or parts therapy, narrative therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and various group uh, forms of group work, uh, like affinity groups, support circles, include a strong focus on the cognitive and emotional components of trauma rather than focusing exclusively on the somatic symptoms. These therapies attend to the core beliefs, internalized narratives, thought patterns, and emotional and physical coping strategies that develop around experiences of moral injury. Beliefs and thought patterns include things like, I'm a bad person, I'm always let down, everyone leaves me. Distorted automatic thoughts or reactions to experiences with others include things like, they're lying, they did that on purpose, I'm going to mess up. Coping strategies might be habits or ways of doing things that were necessary for survival in an inconsistent or unsafe environment like hoarding or running or self-harm, but that now cause difficulty. When making referrals to therapies and other extracurricular activities to support a young person's healing uh, through moral injury and developing a positive life philosophy, take into consideration how that therapy or activity attends to those things. Also consider how the therapy or activity provides consistency, um, it, uh, identity development and value and support and acceptance and relationship. Uh, internal family systems is a form of individual talk therapy that looks at the person as a collection of multiple parts where there is a core self that knows how to heal and additional parts that are developed over time. The additional parts contain valuable qualities and can sometimes uh, be developed through painful experiences like moral injuries that would then carry wounds. Those wounded parts attempt to care for us and to protect us from sustaining additional injuries in ways that no longer serve us or could potentially cause harm. Internal family systems therapy works to empower the core self to heal those wounded parts. And so thinking about this in terms of developing a positive life philosophy, it would be nurturing the parts of you that are compassionate, that are courageous, that hold agency, et cetera. Uh, internal family systems would work to integrate, integrate wounded parts into a cohesive uh, whole. Narrative therapy is more of a framework and can be used in conjunction with other therapies. The, brace, the basic principle is that people understand themselves and their experience in story form, and we consciously and unconsciously develop themes that help us understand our stories and ourselves. Narrative therapy works to pull out and examine those themes. For example, a moral injury related theme might be people always let me down. The person may only remember examples of people letting them down, exacerbating the feeling that is that this is and will always be the case in their life story. Narrative therapy would work to identify experiences when that hasn't been the case, complicating the narrative. Thinking about uh, the life story example uh, earlier, a young person saying, you know, I try not to focus on the bad parts or the bad things. I try to remember that uh, my experience in foster care is temporary. Those are really good examples of complicating a narrative and remaining hopeful because of that. Cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is the practice that helps people connect the dots between their thoughts, feelings, and actions. Uh, in the context of moral injury, the work might be focused around identifying automatic interpretations of interactions and whether those automatic interpretations are helpful or accurate. So thinking about developing a life, uh, a positive life philosophy, it would be identifying the automatic thoughts a person has um, that create really uncomfortable, uh, unhelpful feelings and thus uh, actions that are not in line with what a person wants for themselves um, and trying to alter those automatic thoughts and have them be more in line with things that would develop a positive life philosophy, uh, like forgiveness or um, uh, connectedness. Acceptance and commitment therapy is maybe also more commonly known similar to cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's uh, similar also to cognitive behavioral therapy in that it is action oriented and spends a lot of time thinking about thinking. Um, additional benefits of acceptance and commitment therapy uh, within the context of moral injury are the strong focus on radical acceptance and emo of an emotional experience or of, a, of the place the person's at at that point. 
So because moral injury is a very normal response to experiences that violate our core beliefs, acceptance and commitment therapy helps to achieve a level of functioning that's in line with where the person wants to be while also holding compassion for where they are at that moment. Um, in the context of developing a positive life philosophy, acceptance and commitment therapy would be holding space for the parts of you that are still hurting and not feeling like they're ready to forgive or not feeling like they're ready to feel hopeful about the future uh, while doing work to get them to a place where those things can be true. Um, I, in my clinical practice, like to combine different forms, uh, different modalities and different forms of therapy, for example, including the radical acceptance, acceptance of uh, acceptance and commitment therapy with the methodical processing of cognitive behavioral therapy within the context of a life story or a narrative. And so as providers, as we're thinking about referrals we want to make for our young people, uh, take into consideration uh, whether the practitioner that you're thinking of referring to is able to take a, multi, a multimodal approach to therapy. It's becoming increasingly common uh, in the world of therapy. And so, you know, digging into like, what are this person's preferred forms of therapy is, is getting easier to do. Um, but just be thinking about in what ways is this potential therapist going to address aspects of moral injury rather than exclusively looking at trauma or exclusively looking at like behavioral problems, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now we have some time for questions and your comments on the young people's advice to professionals and to other foster children and youth. Uh, please type similar to the question Wendy asked earlier, you can type in the chat and you can use the hand raise function um, or you can type your questions into the Q and A box. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your participation in our webinar, and please don't hesitate to reach out. Wendy's email is in the top of this, was in the top of this presentation, but I think it's also being shared in the chat box. Um, and if you'd like to be involved in our ongoing efforts to support children and youth involved in the child welfare system, you can also reach out for that. Thank you, everybody. I'll give people a few minutes to think um, about uh, their responses and, and type them into the chat. We are very, because we are really just embarking on this, um, on our um, exploration of moral injury, your comments and reactions are particularly um, useful to us and important. And I'd also like to provide a prompt. Um, I know people are just now starting to get to think about questions they might have, but when this study was done, it was right, it was like right before the data was being collected right as COVID hit. And so I'm thinking, and a lot of my experience also uh, with working with foster youth was pre pandemic. And so I'm curious about what supporting youth uh, looks like when so much of your interactions with youth are limited to online ways of connecting or like remote support. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see we have our first comment. Circling back around to assessing foster parents' motivation, I fully agree that pulling young people aside and chatting with them one-on-one -on -one is imperative. I'm wondering if there are any less obvious signs to look for, uh, look for before in homes, in homes before young people are placed there. I think that's really difficult because you know each young person's subtle signs and each family's you know dynamic is going to look a bit different. Um, I think some some the some things that come to mind for me are looking at the way like if it is a foster family that has other kids like tip like how do they typically interact with each other and looking at like their their normal dynamics or their like baseline dynamics and seeing if things like that change. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think young people, especially young people who have had past experiences in foster care, have ways of noticing things and like nonverbal cues that we don't have if we haven't had that experience. And so it kind of puts us at a disadvantage. Um, and I think also makes it more important that we are listening, like the very obvious answer, like listening to the young people and what they say. 
I have another comment. I think it's important to remember that the vast majority of foster homes are good. I feel like we are focusing on those who've done wrong, but most don't, at least not intentionally. And that is absolutely an important point. And thank you for underscoring that. Just as some of the, the many of our young participants describe moral injury perpetrated by foster um, parents, many others, including some of those who, who <laughs> describe moral injury perpetrated by foster parents, describe the importance of the relationship with the foster parent to supporting them and nurturing them and helping them to develop. So that, um, that that's excellent. I mean, I, I wouldn't want anyone to go away with the impression that um, the experience of moral injury perpetrated by foster parents was typical of foster parents. Not a question, but a comment in response to Michelle. I think we should survey interview youth read their overall experience in the home and attach that to foster care. We have another comment. I've been working in the child welfare system for over 40 years and I've seen and been a part of a lot of system transformation during that time. However, the part that has not really changed is how the system works with children. The resources needed to support child welfare workers, foster parents and community agency increase their focus on an importance of child well-being are not there. In your opinion, what needs to happen to really do something with kids and focus on child well-being more seriously than what is currently being done? Well, I think, Becky, that you are in the best position to educate us on, on, on that. Um, I think if it, the youth reported um, really focused on um, being more child centered. Um, and then when we talk to, uh, when we talk to uh, child welfare workers and parents, they also talked a lot about how challenging it is to be in a system that is so adversarial and where the stakes of system involvement are so high. Um, that there really seems to be a, a real emphasis on, on the um, legal and procedural um, processes that need to happen. And that, that because that's so high stakes, that that can really take away from um, a more child-centered approach. What do you think, Johara? The only thing I would add to that is um, some of what we talked about on Tuesday, uh, which is how important it is for the folks who are providing services to be supported themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to provide truly child-centered, child well-being focused support, caseloads have to be low enough that caseworkers can actually put in the energy that they want to into their cases um, resources, financial resources, therapeutic resources for case managers have to be there in a way that feels supportive rather than draining. Um, just like generally speaking, the child per, uh, child protective caseworkers need to be supported themselves, foster parents, homes of origin need to be supported themselves in order for child well-being focused work to really take place. Thank you, Johara. We have another um, uh, comment in the chat. Stacy, in response to your comment suggestion, I'm a foster home licensor in Michigan, and we interview children in the home, bio adopted, foster, as well as their workers for the foster home evaluation. And that seems like that's you know, that seems like excellent practice. Thank you um, for describing that for us. Andy, we have a question in the QA as well. Oops, okay, let me go over there. In thinking about how youth are groomed for sexual exploitation, trafficking, and realizing that the offenders target exactly um, vulnerabilities created by morally injurious events, lack of trust, previous betrayals, and protection seeking, I'm wondering how pre-adolescents can be given resilience tools, awareness, to be able to resist such grooming techniques. That's a very um, important question. How can kids be taught to differentiate um, between grooming techniques and um, genuine support. 
And Johara, do you have ideas about that? Yeah, I had like a few years where a lot of the work I was doing was with uh, adolescents and pre-adolescents that were experiencing sexual exploitation. And in all of that work and all the training I received in that world, um, almost all the energy is focused on other adults around the young person rather than putting the onus on the young person to be able to differentiate those things because it's very, mm -hmm. it's nearly impossible, which is why it works so well. So having the other adults who are around that young person, if they don't have any consistent adults, finding consistent adults to be around them um, and to create that circle so that when things like that do happen, um, there are adults around who can help the young person remain safe. Or if the young person's already in that situation to provide uh, safe ways for the young person to get out of it. Um, but all the, uh, all the energy is on the adults. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no more comments or questions, I'd like to thank you all for your interest and especially uh, thank you for your participation, your comments, your questions. Um, Johara, it was really helpful to have you here as someone with, um, with deep clinical experience. Um, and now I guess we, we could, we'll turn it over to Stacy. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Johara. And thanks everyone for joining. Apologies again for those of you who <clears throat> joined late and had any issues with the password. We will again be sure to email out the webinar in case you missed the beginning uh, pieces of Wendy's presentation. CEUs and post-tests will be emailed out this week. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us at cashew at umn.edu. The webinar recordings will be emailed out and posted on our website. And when we close out of this um, Zoom call, there will be a really short evaluation. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, and like Wendy had, had mentioned, please email her if you have any questions or want to uh, discuss this topic further. Her email is in the chat as well. It looks like um, we just had one more comment here that we can wrap up with. Um, Becky, the adults involved in sex trafficking often initially provide the targeted youth with a sense of being valued and loved, exactly what so many of the kids experiencing moral injury lack. Thank you, Becky, for the insight, definitely. So thanks again for everybody uh, everybody attending today. We appreciate it. And please let us know if you have any questions and please provide feedback. Thank you very much.